Okay, so welcome to this first video in the playlist on antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. So, in this video what we're going to do is we're going to uh, have a look at the bacterial cell wall. And uh, we're going to look at its um, function mainly. We're not going to look too much detail at its actual structure. That We're going to save that for the coming up videos where we actually look at how it's synthesized and we'll look at its exact structure. And we'll then see how uh, antibiotics affect the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall. In this video, we're going to just have a sort of outline. We're going to look at uh, what the function of the bacterial cell wall is, why it's so essential for bacteria to have a cell wall, um, that will lead us on to looking at the two uh, different types of uh, bacteria, well, the main two types, namely gram-positive and gram-negative. And uh, that then we'll discuss the gram staining process, and that will take us to the end of this video. And then in the next video, we'll move on to looking at um, the actual synthesis of the, belt, uh, of the bacterial cell wall, um, its uh, molecular structure, and then obviously we'll start the core of this, which, which is the study of the antibiotics which affect bacterial cell wall, cell wall synthesis. Right, okay, so firstly let's have a little bit of a discussion about what the need for a bacterial cell wall is. So, why can't we just have a bacterial cell which just has a cell membrane? Why do you need a bacterial cell wall around the cell membrane? So here's a cell membrane. What is wrong with just having a cell with a cell membrane? Why do you need a bacterial cell wall? And I'll spoil the, give the, you the spoiler now, the bacterial cell wall goes around the cell membrane like so. So it's peripheral to the cell membrane. Why do you need it at all? Well, this is the reason. The, um, the uh, intracellular compartment is hypertonic, which means that the concentration of solute in the, um, in the intracellular compartment is greater than the concentration of solute in the extracellular compartment. So what do I mean by that? I mean if you look at, at a certain volume of intracellular fluid, let's say you look at one millimeter, milliliter of intracellular fluid, and you look at one milliliter of extracellular fluid, and you count up absolutely every single solute molecule that is within one milliliter of extracellular fluid, and you count up every single solute molecule that is in one milliliter of intracellular fluid, then the number of solute molecules in the intracellular fluid will be greater. I, if you look at uh, a certain volume of intracellular and extracellular fluid, and you compare how many uh, solute molecules are dissolved in that certain volume, um, then you'll find that the answer is greater in the intracellular compartment than in the extracellular compartment. So, we say that uh, the intracellular compartment is hypertonic of the extracellular compartment, or another expression for that is hyperosmolar, because the osmolarity of um, the intracellular compartment is um, greater than the osmolarity of the in extracellular compartment. Okay, right. So, what does this mean? Well, it means that water is going to... Um, tends to move into the intracellular compartment because um, it is hypertonic of the extracellular compartment. So by osmosis, what would happen is water would move from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. So let me just give you my brief favorite, um, favorite sort of um, explanation of why osmosis occurs. So, if we have two compartments, like so, separated by a membrane which is permeable to water, so this is the analogy of the cell membrane here, so this is analogous to the cell membrane, and uh, this compartment here, we'll say, is analogous to the intracellular compartment, and this compartment is analogous to the extracellular compartment. So I hope you agree that this is a good model for what I've got over there. All right, so I'm saying we have a much higher solute concentration in this uh, intracellular compartment than we do in the extracellular compartment. So we have a lot more ions or whatever solute molecule you're talking about in this intracellular compartment than you do in the extracellular compartment. So maybe it's something like that. 
Now, solute molecules will interact with water molecules. So, for instance, let's say we are talking about an ion, and I want to emphasize that when I say a solute molecule, I don't just mean ions. I mean anything which is interacting with the water molecules. But ions are very nice examples. Okay, so let's say we have a positively charged ion here. Basically, water is a polar molecule here, like so. So, water is shown here. And... Um, Basically, uh, the oxygen um, atom has a greater electronegativity than the hydrogen atoms, which means that the pull on electrons by the uh, nucleus of the oxygen atom is greater than the pull on electrons by the hydrogen nucleus. Now, in each one of these bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogen, there are electrons, basically. And the, these two electrons, this pair of electrons, are feeling a pull by the hydrogen nucleus and a pull by the oxygen nucleus. But as I say, the pull that they're going to feel by the oxygen nucleus is greater than the pull that they feel by the hydrogen nucleus. So the electrons basically sit closer to the oxygen nucleus than they do to the hydrogen nucleus. They spend more time around the oxygen than they do around the hydrogen. This gives oxygen a slight negative charge, and it gives the hydrogens a slight positive charge. That's what's meant by water being a polar molecule. Now, if we have some ion that is in the intracellular fluid, and probably potassium would have been a better example because we know potassium is very high in the intracellular fluid, but we will have some sodium in the intracellular fluid, what's going to happen is that water is going to interact with these ions because the oxygen has this partial negative charge, so it's going to face in and bind with these sodium ions which have a positive charge just by an electrostatic interaction. So you get water molecules surrounding the sodium ion and this is known as the hydration shell of the um, sodium ion. Now, the general principle that I want you to understand is that if there's loads of solute dissolved in this intracellular compartment, then all the water molecules are going to be interacting with the solute molecules. So they will not exist just as free water molecules. And by a free water molecule, I mean a water molecule on its own, with no friends, basically. It's not bound to anything. It's just a free water molecule. Basically, the number of free water molecules in this intracellular compartment is going to be much lower than the number of free molecules in the extracellular compartment because most of the water molecules are going to want to interact with these solute molecules, whereas in here you're going to have much more uh, free water molecules that are actually free. Now, only the free water molecules can actually cross this cell membrane, not the water molecules that are involved in massive great complexes. So, if you've got more free water in this extracellular compartment than in the intracellular compartment, then the number of free water molecules that could just happen to hit this membrane and go through it uh, is going to be greater than the number of free water molecules that just happen to hit from this side and go through into the extracellular compartment. So, overall, the movement of free water molecules in this direction from extracellular to intracellular is going to beat the number of free water molecules moving in the opposite direction from intracellular to extracellular. So you're going to get a net movement of water from extracellular to intracellular. And that is what we call osmosis from the extracellular to the intracellular compartment. So you're going to get water moving from the extracellular into this intracellular compartment and that's going to boost the volume of this cell. So what's going to happen? The cell is going to blow up like a balloon, basically. And what would happen is you'd get osmotic, osmotic lysis, basically, because the cell would, volume would increase so much that it just bursts the cell membrane. So basically the cell membrane would split up and fragment and you'd get osmotic lysis. So the cell would lose all sort of integrity, basically. You'd get osmotic lysis. Right, because, as I say, it would just burst, effectively. Right. So that is what the purpose of the bacterial cell wall is to do. The bacterial cell wall is basically going to sit around the cell membrane, and when osmosis starts to occur, and the volume of fluid in this intracellular compartment boosts up, what will happen is the cell membrane will get pushed outwards, it will push right up against the cell wall here, but the cell wall is rigid. It's not going to move. It's going to just 
stop the cell membrane from expanding anymore. So, even though there is an osmotic driving force trying to drive water in here, water's not going to come in because the volume of the uh, intracellular compartment cannot increase anymore. The cell wall is basically blocking that. So you're not going to get any more water coming in, even though there's still the uh, hypertonic um, difference between the extracellular and the intracellular compartment. You won't get any further movement of water. So that is the purpose of the bacterial cell wall. It prevents osmotic lysis. It allows the intracellular compartment to be hypertonic of the extracellular compartment and uh, still not uh, burst due to um, osmosis of water moving into uh, the intracellular compartment. Okay, right. So, in the next video, what we'll do is we'll discuss uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and we'll discuss the gram-staining process, basically.